It's really amazing to think how many people want to come and hear Jeff Kuhn speak. It is a fantastic thing, and Jeff is truly one of the rock stars of the art world. And Jeff, really, thank you so much for being here. You know, I don't, I don't think there's a need for any formal introductions, uh, but when I think about Jeff, you know, you've been described as the most important, most beloved, most controversial, most envied, most wealthy, most poetic, most generous, most, most, most fill-in-the-blank artist in the world today. Maybe we can start with a question or two about some of the works downstairs. So Cat on the Clothesline, which you uh, were welcomed when you first came off the elevator, um, is obviously a very dramatic piece. It's dated 1994 to 2001. So can you just talk a little bit about the history of that piece? What was the, the source imagery and why it took so long to, to actually bring to life? Uh, Glenn, it's really great to be here. So uh, fantastic. It's nice to participate in this exhibition and to show with uh, Charlie and Cecily. Uh, Cat in a Clothesline uh, it, it came from a, a body of work uh, right after the Banality Show. And uh, so I was still very, very influenced by uh, postcards and images that I would see in gift shops and traveling through airports. Uh, so uh, that's where the kind of the inspiration came from. But I wanted to uh, work in a different material. I didn't want to work in uh, you know, a marble or, or different materials like that. And I thought that, uh, you know, polyethylene would be a material that would really kind of capture a child having kind of adult fantasy. And, and, and the material, was it technically difficult to actually manufacture as an artwork on that scale? Is that, was it the material that drove the time frame or was it, was it something else? Uh, the material. And, uh, you know, there were other pieces within the Celebration series that I also wanted to put in polyethylene. Uh, the Play-Doh sculpture that uh, I showed at the Whitney here in New York. Uh, that was in aluminum, but originally I wanted to have it be in polyethylene. Again, to have this same type of generosity that uh, children feel that, you know, when they can have their own house, like in the backyard, a little tykes kind of polyethylene house and their own car to ride around in to capture that kind of joy and uh, fantasy. And when you look at winter bears, the, the, the two really kind of super happy uh, bears, which my daughter loves, that is one piece that happens to be mine. And it, uh, it is the first thing you see when you come into our apartment. And my daughter to this day is still, Daddy, when are we getting the bears back? Uh, she's turning, she's almost four years old. Uh, but it is such a happy piece. Um, that is made out of wood and was carved, I believe, in Germany. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I started working in Germany around 1980, uh, around 86, 87. And so I spent a lot of time looking at the Baroque churches, the Baroque and the Rococo. And so it influenced my work a lot because I wanted to make work that would uh, kind of meet people's needs, that you could experience transcendence. And so churches would uh, meet your needs that you would go in and economically you wouldn't feel uh, depressed. You would feel like you had enough money in your pocket just through the gold and the silver, the type of materialism. There were all these polarities taking place. You would have the idea of the eternal through biology. You know, you would have uh, uh, cows and uh, you would have uh, organic life in the architecture. Uh, but at the same time, you would have the idea of the eternal through very kind of spiritual, ephemeral, uh, abstract realms. So uh, in creating a piece like Cat in a Clothesline, it's a crucifixion also. Uh, it's also like a child in the womb. You know, you could look at the flowers and their ovaries. Or, you know, it's a crucifixion. So they're all making these kind of uh, references to uh, transcendence. Winter bears, it's using wood. Uh, it's an organic material. It's considered a living material. Uh, it's always kind of uh, moving. And uh, the churches would use it uh, to, again, try to communicate uh, transcendence to the viewer. On Winter Bears, on the back, it's actually carved Franz Weiser, who's the, the name, I guess, of the wood craftsman who made the piece. Is that right? Or was he the original? What, 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 who was Franz Weiser? Uh, yeah, he was a, an artisan that I worked with. Uh, when I made, that's from the uh, Banality series. And when I made the Banality show, I would uh, travel around. I'd go to trade fairs. I would. Uh, go to different sculptors, people who would create uh, works for the church, and I'd visit their studios, and I would choose people that I felt uh, had, you know, something in their work that I could kind of exploit for my work. 
the person that I chose to make uh, uh, Winter Bears was Franz. He also worked on uh, Stacked and uh, Buster Keaton. He worked on a couple of my pieces. Michael Jackson was Villery. Uh, he created works in porcelain and he would make Venuses coming out of uh, conch shells and everything would be gold and white porcelain. So I would really try to pick people that I felt were perfect and already uh, you know, had a dialogue within the medium that I was looking for. It's, it's obviously well documented that you are not personally making your works um, and these artisans are, all, are making them, but that is a relatively rare example where you actually cite the name of the person involved. Have you, have you ever thought of listing the names of the people that make the paintings or make the other sculptures, similar to Franz Weiser? Um, uh, you know, Glenn, when I'm working with these images, I'm, I'm trying to work with objects and images that there's a familiarity with them. So uh, when a viewer comes across uh, uh, the image or the object, automatically you're open to have a dialogue with it uh, so that it can be a quick dialogue, uh, not to lose the, uh, uh, the possibility. But uh, what's really uh, of interest to me is the viewer. The objects are metaphors for people. And I'm dealing with uh, acceptance. So I'm um, looking at objects that, if you look at it socially, there's some kind of play that a lot of people would maybe feel that they're not relevant objects, that there's kind of higher objects. And I'm trying to dismantle that hierarchy that everything is perfect in its own being. And, uh, but it's all a metaphor for people. And it's about that we experience self-acceptance and that then we can go on and we can accept other people. But, but in terms of the creation aspect of it, I mean, the creation is in your mind and as the artist creating the work, not so much the execution. Um, do, you, do you miss at all like your hand in the work or is that just really not a relevant thing for you? Uh, I accepted Franz. You accepted Franz? <laughs> no, but uh, no, so I would look, I would find uh, artisans to work with, but everything's my own work. And uh, you know, it's like being a, a conductor, or even articulating, moving my fingers right now. You know, my mind's thinking about controlling them, and I, I want to bend this finger. And it, you know, it's it, it's working with people in a similar way. I'm responsible for each and every mark, and there's not a mark on my uh, work, whether it's a sculpture or uh, something on my painting, that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. Every color, uh, everything about it. I like for that, having seen you in the studio. For yeah, sure. but uh, the reason I work with people, I don't want to be in a room alone by myself. I mean, I'd really be bored with that. And I remember as a young artist learning personal iconography and learning that I could affect, you know, my feelings. I could affect how I would feel through different imagery and working with colors and textures. And, and, uh, but after a while, I wanted to go outside the self. And, uh, and so that journey uh, outward really is just taking you to the acceptance of others. And that is objective art. I want to be with people. I want to interact with people. That's what's really relevant in life. Uh, the objects, the images that we work with, our experiences with art, what's relevant are not these objects. It's uh, the type of possibilities we feel for ourselves and what we can share with other people that they can have in heightened possibilities. That's where the art is. That's what's of value. Sling hook, the, the lobster and the dolphin hanging downstairs, um, everybody is blown away that it's not just two pool toys. I mean, I, I, we've had events here, people are like, why, why is that such a big deal? They're just two pool toys. And they don't understand it. And when you tell them it's actually painted aluminum, they have like a little bit of a, like it, it blows their mind. And, and, and kids, needless to say, kids love the show, but kids can't really understand that it's not really like a blown up balloon. That trompe ploy aspect of fooling the eye, what does that is, that, is that a significant part of the work for you is that, and others as well, where you've really gone to these painstaking details to make it look like something that it isn't? Um, I would say the most important thing is kind of a sense of uh, a commitment, a certain uh, morality uh, to the, uh, the viewer. And uh, you know, I think of Steve Jobs when he talks about his uh, his phones or his computers. That all of the uh, the care that goes on the inside that you don't even see. It's the same type of dialogue I've always have been involved with uh, with my work. I remember uh, casting a Bob Hope sculpture. I guess it was back in '86, and 
I went to, to see it at the foundry. It was the first time I was working with Talix. And I went there and I, I picked up Bob Hope and they didn't cast the felt on the bottom of the sculpture. And I was, you know, where's the bottom? And it was, wait, who cares about the bottom, you know? Nobody's gonna look at the bottom. And no, you know, it's really important. It's just like the detail on the bottom's as important as the detail on his nose. And uh, so, uh, you know, this type of uh, dialogue and relationship with uh, objects has always been really of the utmost importance to me. I think that's a great analogy. I can definitely see Steve Jobs as, as, and a lot of Steve's philosophy in, in, in your work and well, in how you approach it. it it's this, it's, you never want to lose uh, trust uh, with the viewer. You want to be able to show the viewer that you care about them and you're trying to uh, let them maintain this kind of abstraction, this uh, for as long as, uh, as long as possible. And that what you care about is them. This is a, a dialogue. And so with, with those three works in particular, but obviously I think it goes with your work overall, you know, how do you think about the dichotomy between sexuality and childhood innocence? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you know, I make reference to childhood. I make reference to childhood because I think it's a period that we're all very open and uh, we participate and uh, we enjoy acceptance. You know, we look at the sky and we love the blue. Or we can, uh, you know, roll over on the ground and look at the grass and just smell it and think, oh, you know, it's, it's so wonderful, the, uh, the aroma and the color green. And we're open to everything. Uh, uh, we don't segregate. Uh, and so I, I make reference uh, to it for that. Uh, and it, it's being excited about the senses and the exploration of the senses. And then when you uh, start to you know, become a little older and go into adolescence, uh, you start to realize that you, know, you want more. And there's this transformation of, uh, from the senses of feelings and sensations that you start to realize they become ideas. And I think this happens in, uh, in youth and in, uh, you know, kind of a teenage. Uh, I mean, have you had to manage that at all yourself, just through your work and your own children, and kind of what is appropriate to discuss with your kids as they've grown up? Because obviously some of your work is more appropriate than others. Uh, I remember taking my family to uh, uh, Kunst, uh, Kunst House in, uh, in Basel and uh, going through and seeing, uh, uh, not, not in Basel, Gary, in the... Uh, no, not Byler. Swit along the lake. No, the famous architecture. Bregenz. Bregenz in Bregenz. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so in Bregenz, and you know, I went there with my uh, family, and uh, a lot of the made in heaven work was there, uh, painting like Ilona's asshole, uh, exaltation, uh, some of the strongest of the made in heaven series. And I went through with my children, and some of them at the time were like uh, three years old, uh, five years old, you know, uh, eight years old. And uh, they didn't say a word. You know, they would look at the Pink Panther. Oh, there's a Pink Panther, okay. There's the rabbit. And they'd look over, and there'd be alone as asshole. And, uh, you know, they didn't think anything <laughs> about it. You know? And uh, so, you know, they automatically, I think, would understand the dialogue of the work. And it was just like every man, every woman. It was like an Adam and Eve. It was a dialogue that you would see that was just about biology and about uh, one form of the eternals through the biological and kind of the, the continuation of that by, again, participating in acceptance. Uh, I, I do think that um, in America, nudity is, is made into a much bigger deal uh, certainly for, for children. I mean, my three and three quarters year old daughter was here on Saturday and she went right up to the Charlie Ray sculpture of the boy with the little car and she says, oh, look, Daddy, he's playing with a little, little car, you know, and she was oblivious to the fact that he was naked. It didn't matter. And, you know, I, I, I feel like kids deal with, with nudity much better than adults do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, the landscape uh, has changed with uh, the different forms of uh, media and what children are exposed to. It's very, very different than uh, I mean, you, even 20 years ago. You, you've shown with Charles Ray quite a bit, and um, you're, you're certainly uh, contemporaries. You know, what, what do you think are the core similarities between your two practices and the core differences? I think that we, uh, I think we both enjoy history, and uh, you know, we love other artworks. We love other uh, artists' work. And it's an appreciation of that. I think we both are having a dialogue about 
the continuation of art. We don't uh, feel that it's a, a moment or that when he creates a piece, it's just about that piece. It's about that in relationship to other works that have existed prior and maybe uh, other works that will come after uh, that moment. I think we share that. I think uh, uh, a joy of, uh, of material and trying to find a certain dialogue uh, that certain materials are better to use and kind of exploit that dialogue than, uh, than others. And what about the differences? Uh, the difference, uh, I would say that uh, Charlie likes to celebrate weight more than I do. Generally, mm -hmm. I usually find weight as a problem, mm -hmm. uh, except for I created a piece one time called The Dictator, and uh, that weighs like, uh, I guess, uh, 11 tons or something like that. It's a really heavy uh, uh, sculpture. But uh, I think there are many more similarities mm -hmm. uh, uh, than differences. You know? Yeah, I would agree. I think the comment about material is spot on because you could talk to Charlie about two different works and you know, he's like, Glenn, they're completely different. One is solid aluminum and one is solid steel. There's nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when, uh, but the joy of art you know, enjoying other artworks, it, it's not about, oh, I, I like that painting, I like that sculpture. It's enjoying other people. And it's back that you're having a dialogue with these artisans. And it's, uh, you know, the things that they've experienced, the different uh, conquests, the summits that they've reached. And again, the opportunity that it allows you to have and then how you can share that with other people. So when I look at Charlie's work, I'm in a dialogue with the ancients, you know, many other artists are, are there, and uh, I mean, looking at the uh, the young girl riding the horse. I mean, you just look at the face of the girl, and there are like five other artists that all of a sudden you're also having a dialogue with, you know, about being a human being. It's great. My daughter really liked that piece a lot too, by the way. I have to tell Charlie. Um, and I wanted to ask you about a, 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 an unrealized work. You, you've uh, envisioned this incredible sculpture of a giant train, a choo-choo train, life-size that would be hanging from a giant crane. Is that something that's still, you know, kind of a, not an objective of yours to see, you know, realized? Is it just too complicated or too expensive? Where, where does that stand in your mind? Uh, you know, Glenn, I would love to see it uh, be built. It, it almost got built. They, they thought about having it on the High Line. And then I think one of the large tenants in one of the buildings uh, wasn't really for uh, the piece. But uh, I really love it because uh, it's a sculpture. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a large crane. And the crane's about 166 feet tall to, to the top. And hanging from it is uh, an old uh, steam engine from like, uh, I guess uh, 1923, I think the, the year was. But it's a very large steam engine, one of the largest uh, made. And it was set up that it would uh, perform uh, multiple times a day. And it would start just kind of, everything that a real train does, it takes eight hours for it to build up enough energy to leave a station. But this would be speeded up and the sequence would go quite fast. But maybe within 20 minutes, that eight hours would take place. You'd start to see the, off the firebox that the light is starting to flicker from the heat of the engine and maybe then you would hear a ding ding and then all of a sudden you would have a first kind of puff of steam you know when the piston would fire and uh, you know, again it's a metaphor for people we're breathing machines you know and this engine is just inhaling exhaling you know and just continue to build momentum until about three minutes in it, uh, into it, it would be going at full speed, which was around 100 miles an hour. And then it would be woo, 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 woo this kind of orgasmic uh, climax. And then it would completely just descend in the same kind of bell curve to uh, the last kind of puff of uh, smoke coming out. I mean, it's an absolutely spectacular thing. And you can Google it, and you can see it, see it on, the, on the web. And, and, and it did almost happen here. And if in your if you had to guess, if somebody out there said, I want to make that happen, you know, I'll write a check, what, what would something like that cost? Uh, I, I believe that it can be made somewhere between 25 to 50 million. Really? Okay. I mean, I would just say that if you think about that, because that would, wherever that went, any city, anybody out there that wants to put a stamp on a city, this train would do it. <laughs> um, you know, you, you think about the way the puppy has just branded Bilbao and completely changed that city. Um, you know, way back when I had talked to Anthony about getting the other copy of Puppy for a City um, that I'm, I'm, I was 
definitely bummed it didn't happen. I can't say it came too close to being realistic, but we did talk about it. Um, you know, those works are so significant and really do, in, in many ways, belong in the city. Um, the other puppy is, is, is more or less in a backyard, um, although it does get seen sometimes. And Split Rocker will be, in a, hopefully, in a, in a public setting, more or less. Um, do, you, do, you, do you like the idea, and do you, would you want to do more of those kind of giant public um, presentations where your work really can just be seen by so many people every day? Uh, you know, I, I enjoy working on uh, public art uh, projects. When I was younger, uh, I had an aunt that lived in Philadelphia. I grew up in Pennsylvania, but we would go visit my aunt. And I remember she took me to the top of City Hall. And on the top of City Hall, there's a statue of William Penn. And it was made by Alexander uh, Calder's uh, grandfather. And it's an amazing experience because it, when you get up to the top of the dome of the Capitol building, it's like a uh, Jules uh, Verne type of architecture. I mean, there's uh, these rivets going around and you feel like it's journey to the center of the earth or something. And you have this very, very tall uh, sculpture of William Penn, a huge bronze, uh, you know, taller than the, the length of this room here. But when you can experience uh, this aspect of history, communal history, uh, with kind of scale and something that rallies a community together, it's a powerful experience. And so I, I like to think about how I was moved at that moment by, you know, going up uh, to the top of City Hall, William Penn, and this sense of combining uh, a kind of a past of a community with uh, the excitement of the senses that, you know, you feel alive through the, the experience of this type of interaction but it automatically wants you to, to have a dialogue about what it means to be part of a community, have something that they can rally around. And I think that's what the, the, the experience of the train is very, very dynamic. Uh, you know, like uh, it's a heightening of kind of sexual energy, all of these things, it's a metaphor. But it's also working like a steeple or something that's uniting uh, a community together that you would gather around. No, it's no, it's it's absolutely incredible, and I'm I hope that it really does come together because I think it would be spectacular. Um, talk a little bit about you. You worked on a project with Lady Gaga. What what was that like? And what was maybe one wonderful thing you remember from Lady Gaga? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's a very nice experience because uh, you know, she, she's an artist. She's a very very sensitive uh, person. And I remember when she, uh, I met her at a Met Ball gala one time and, uh, you know, uh, it came up, I was introduced to her and, you know, she just came over and just hugged my leg and <laughs> kind of went down on me a little bit <laughs> as far as where she was uh, standing and positioning herself. And, and, uh, and she just then said, you know, I've been such a fan, you know, I would sit in the park and smoke pot with my friends and we talk <laughs> about your art. And she was so uh, kind of just nice and innocent that way. But she came to the studio and uh, she told me that she wanted to make this album called uh, Pop Art and she wanted to work with different artists such as Maria and myself and, and that, uh, you know, uh, would I have interest? And we started to talk about art and she started to cry. I mean, she just started really bawling because she was so uh, sensitive to everything. And uh, uh, so I, I remember that, that was very endearing. And then another time was when we were ready to shoot the uh, cover and uh, she just wanted to make Made in Heaven. I mean, she just wanted to get naked and come on, Jeff, let's, uh, let's do Made in Heaven. And, uh, and I was like, well, you know, I don't know, that was in the past, but uh, come on, come on. So, but uh, she was really nice to work with and uh, you know, she's really uh, supportive to so many, you know, parts of the community and, uh, and art, you know. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a great story. Um, <laughs> can you, can you um, talk a little bit about, about your own collecting? Obviously, there's a lot of collectors in the room here. Um, you, you, you really, you often collect old masters and works from previous times. What, what is it about that type of work that you find particularly interesting in, as a collector? Um, well, I remember my first art history class in uh, college, and it was really a changing moment in my life when uh, my teacher, Bo Davis, put up a slide of uh, Monet's work, and it was Olympia. Mm -hmm. And he started to talk about the different meanings, the symbolic meaning of the cat and uh, uh, the woman with the flowers and the pose of way uh, the woman's looking out at you. 
And it really changed my life because to that moment, I had no idea why I was involved with art. Uh, it was just something where I could make illusions, create depth, and do these different things. But I had no idea what the power of art was till that moment. And then I realized I could be in a dialogue. I could be involved with philosophy, psychology, sociology, uh, aesthetics, physics. I mean, all the areas that I hope that you can see a little bit that my work kind of tries to make reference to. But that I had all these areas of life to be involved with a community, to really be engaged. And uh, so it was life changing for me. That's what I like about art history. I, I feel that, you know, it's uh, interacting with these people. I'm, I'm a different person since I came across Manet's work. I think my genes are different. I think that uh, I'm a different human being. And is it when you come home and you look at these work like you're transported to a different time? Uh, yes, and a different, uh, you know, you relate to what it was like to be alive at that time. You think about their lives, uh, sensitivity to their life. But it also just gives you a sense of your own potential. I feel stronger. It's kind of like inviting the kind of the gods into your body in a way. And it's whatever's being, you know, coming from that work that you're, you're looking at. So if you think of Monet or Manet, uh, you know, 100, 200 years ago, what do you want the world to think about Jeff Koons in 200 years? How would you like your legacy to be shown also? Would you want your work to be at a museum? Would you want to have the equivalent of a Rothko Chapel? Would you want to have a Koons Museum? I mean, do you think about what you'd like your legacy to be really 100 plus years from now? Uh, I would say the first part of my legacy would be my children, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, they're, they're happy people and that they are productive within their community and uh, you know, that, uh, that I've been a good parent and that uh, try to create a lot of opportunity for them. Then after that, I would say as an artist, I hope that I represent, I want to be the best artist I can possibly be. I want to uh, exercise the freedom that, that we all have in life, but to exercise that freedom that we have to make gesture. I mean, we can reach a level of consciousness if we just open ourselves up to that uh, ability to make those gestures too. Uh, I mean, it feels like uh, all the freedom that we have is just paralleling us right now. And I don't want on my deathbed to be there that all of a sudden that clarity comes right at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, you know, why didn't I do it, you know? You know, it would have been so easy. It was right there the whole time. Why didn't I just realize I was so free? I could have just done that. I could have done it. You know, I want to achieve that now. And so... Uh, but does part of that involve having your work in museums? Is that something that's important to you? I think it involves uh, having people have the opportunity to interact with the work because you know, just to make it for yourself, that's one thing, but you want to share that experience with other people. Right. So uh, museums are functioning in a way to help educate people, create a platform that they can see art, uh, uh, experience it. Uh, but just as we talked about public art uh, uh, places, uh, and what you want is just that people understand their possibilities. Uh, Alexander Calder's grandfather did that for me with that sculpture of William Penn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just want to affect people's lives. It's, it's an interesting point because I think, you know, collectors often think what should they do with their collection? Should they give it to a museum? Should they sell it at auction? And it is a struggle because often, 99% of the time, if you give it to a museum, it's going to be in the basement more than it's going to be on display. Um, whereas, you know, selling it to another collector to enjoy, it's more likely going to be viewed and enjoyed more. So, um, you know, I know artists feel differently at different points in time about how much work they want to see in a museum and how museums can manage it. You've been lucky that you have a lot of collectors that have their own museums, so they can show your work uh, much more frequently. And uh, obviously the Broad, you must be thrilled with how that turned out and how your work looks in that museum. Uh, well, I think the Broad's fantastic. I think for you know my generation, it's uh, an amazing collection of work, and uh, it's it's beautiful. The, the lighting and uh, that's, so I think it's an amazing uh, collection. I'm very very proud to participate in it. Uh, as far as when I come home, I don't come home to any of my works. Uh, you know, I, I'm around my works all day long, and I 
it's, uh, I love being there, and uh, it's no place that I'm probably happier than uh, just being in the studio. Uh, but when I come home, another reason I collect is so that my children, when they think about art, they don't think of their father. My wife, Justine, is also an artist, so that they don't think about her either. They think of us as mom and dad. And when they think about art, they think about these other people. You know, they'll think about you know, the works we enjoy to be around. They'll think about, uh, you know, some of these names are great names, Manet and Picasso and Dali and Magritte, but uh, that's what they think about art. So they have so much more possibility, I think, as individuals to be involved in the arts, uh, the fine arts, much more freedom. Uh, are any of your kids showing you signs of having an interest in being an artist? Uh, I think they all do. I mean, uh, uh, they all love to draw from my youngest, uh, uh, Mickey, to uh, my oldest, uh, you know, Sean. They all love art. So, uh, but I think it creates a, a lot of freedom. And uh, it's them. good to be able to be. Usually, usually people have to choose or not choose, but they, they 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 take a path as being more of an artist or a collector. You've been lucky that you can be an artist and a collector. Yes, and you know, people. I mean, I think we collect in all different ways. Uh, uh, they're different. Uh, you know, collecting postcards, or there, there's so many areas in life. But, uh, you know, art is something that uh, I enjoy, and I understand, I really believe in its value, and you know, its value is that it changes your life. Uh, one of the first major pieces that I acquired was a Picasso Kiss from 1969, and it really helped me feel free again. I started to feel, uh, a loss of freedom following kind of Duchampian ideas and it was so removed from kind of intuitive thought that uh, all of a sudden you know getting involved in Picasso's work and seeing how everything goes full circle and through intuitive thought it becomes so layered one thought on top of another it just goes full circle into the realm of the objective and uh, it just brought so much freedom back into my life and you know I can look at that painting and I can look at it and see Picasso referencing uh, you know, Titian and referencing uh, all the different uh, uh, aspects, sexual conquests and also artistic conquests in his life and just layer upon layer that's referenced in the work. I mean, Picasso, Warhol, they're always referenced in, in your kind of your body of work. Um, how do you see Dali as, as, a, as an important figure in your work? Well, as a young artist, it was the first kind of tabletop book that I had. And I think that uh, what's really interesting about surrealism uh, and Dada, but uh, mostly surrealism, is that it helps inform people that, you know, about this inward life, to go inward and to deal with the self, a dialogue about the self, what you dreamt the night before, personal iconography, all these aspects of controlling your emotions, realizing you can affect other people's emotions, uh, that all of a sudden you, you learn to trust in yourself. And uh, so I, I appreciate uh, Dali for that. I think that also uh, he was generous to me as a young person. I contacted him. I asked if I could visit him. He told me to come to New York. He'd meet me at the hotel where he was staying. And he took the time out for just this kid that was uh, you know, just kind of a country bumpkin. And, uh, and I, I came and I left that day after spending just a couple hours with him here in New York. He was, uh, he invited me to go to the Nodler Gallery and to look at an exhibition. Well, I say a couple hours. He was there with uh, uh, a friend looking at the work and he would come over and say, you know, do you want to take some photographs? And I would say yes. And, you know, he'd put the mustache up. and. <laughs> A very, very uh, uh, generous uh, with his time. But I left that day thinking, you know, I can do this too. I can make art a way of life and be involved with a community. And that's all I've ever really wanted to do is to participate, be in a dialogue with other people. And I thought of Dali as all about like the avant-garde mm -hmm. and this dialogue with like Bacabia and Duchamp, all of this. I mean, to hear you talking about, about this and also your own feelings of making the work and taking chances. I mean, how do you, again, because there are a lot of artists out there, how do you verbalize the balance between risk and failure in your own life and your own work that you're thinking about making? I never think about the failure. You know, I'll, I'll, I let things resonate, and when I'm ready to make a, a gesture, you know, I, I will just uh, do it. 
Uh, I remember a certain moment in my life, it was right before my Equilibrium show, and I, I worked, I saved up a lot of money to make different bronzes and to, to make the tanks and everything, but I had no options. I, I mean, if I failed, uh, it didn't matter. I, I would accept the consequences. I would pump gas, whatever it was, it didn't matter. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's all you can do in life. And again, You really I, focus on the risk first. You're, you're, you are a risk taker. Well, I think that it follows. I think that if you, and this comes from my family, from my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, everybody, my parents. I was just brought up that, uh, you know, if you kind of contribute to society, and they were all merchants and they enjoyed interacting with people, but if you, you know, contribute to society and it's of any value, there will be support there for you. And that's it. So you come from a, a business history. Your family is, is merchants, and, and you have business background in your family. Uh, I was brought up to be self-reliant. So, uh, and I would go door to door as a child. I'd sell gift wrapping paper. I would sell uh, candies, uh, and I, I loved it. I think it's really important to uh, becoming an artist and uh, being involved in the dialogue that I am, because you know I would go uh, door to door. I'd knock on that door. And you know, you never knew what the person was going to look like that opened the door. You never knew the odor that was going to come out of the home. <laughs> you know, and so this kind of act of acceptance and of uh, interacting with people, and to communicate, to have a dialogue with, uh, you know, with strangers, but that and to find this commonality of. Uh, but but I think that, that, that role in your genes clearly showed through. I mean, it really, until you really made it a, a fact that artist and businessman together was considered an oxymoron. And I think now people recognize that if you want to be a successful artist, you have to think like a business person. Uh, well, I, you know, uh, Ileana Sonnenben would say, you know, uh, Jeff, a businessman. <laughs> oh, you know. So I'm more along with Ileana. You know, I'm a committed artist, and I just, I, I love making art, you know, and... Uh, You're not going to give yourself credit for any business savvy at all? I, I would, my grandfather was a politician, and uh, he was city treasurer in York. I would say that I try to be at service of my work, you know. I try to help my work have the platform that it can, and uh, do everything that I can have the opportunity to make the gestures that I want to make. But uh, it comes from trying to create something strong and powerful and uh, moving to function uh, as something that, uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, it contributes to society. If that happens, then, you know, uh, I'll be okay. I mean, you mentioned Ileana Sonnabend. What, what was it about her that was so unique as an as a, as a artist dealer and, and a gallery representative, representative for you? Uh, she loved art. And Ileana would, uh, you know, support the artist. She supported my work absolutely blindly, you know. I, I would go off, I would say, uh, you know, Ileana, I'm going to make this show called Banality, and I'm going to need you to send money to this company, this company, and I'd work with like 13 different companies, and she would just do it. And so uh, once she committed, she had complete uh, uh, kind of uh, trust, and she informed and educated the people around her so the different collectors, if, if she enjoyed work, she wanted her friends to be able to, to experience the work and to be able to collect the work. And, uh, and then they always, uh, Ileana Antonio, always had the responsibility to try to kind of inform people about uh, the work. And another uh, thing that I really loved, she would always kind of just mix it up. And she would say, okay, there are, there are addition of three, and okay, so uh, this person's very important collector, and you know, they've been buying from the gallery for years, so this, we're gonna let them have it. And this person in uh, you know, Chicago is the top collector. And then, you know, Jeff, this person just came in off the street. Let's let them have this one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the way she was. And, and she always kept it mixed up that way. Talk about your memories of Anthony Dauphé. Because, I mean, you've, you've really gone, you've had a lot of very legendary dealers work, to work with. What was, what was really unusual about Anthony? Uh, you know, Anthony had an uh, amazing uh, gallery in London. And uh, Anthony was, you know, had a, a great eye and was also, uh, you know, very uh, supportive of my work. I think helped introduce my work, at least within, uh, you know, kind of uh, the England and, 
it helped uh, establish my work internationally, even though Ileana really had already laid out a tremendous uh, uh, platform uh, for my work. Uh, but then, uh, you know, Anthony, we worked together on Celebration. He was one of the dealers involved with that. And then Anthony ended up, you know, uh, kind of stepping back and uh, pulling back. I mean, in the, in the old days of, uh, of, of, of dealers, there was an important role they played as an editor. Do you believe that artists need editing anymore? You know, writers and, and musicians use editing as a part of their practice. Do you, do you feel like you need any editing? Uh, maybe I didn't realize somebody was editing. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, the dealers that I've worked with have never really been editors. Uh, you know, they've been uh, dealers that have, uh, you know, had trust in artists, or really uh, believed in the work. One of the things that I think a lot of people uh, miss today of a younger generation, young artists, uh, we had the opportunity to have a lot of different relationships with different people, different galleries, different groups around the world. So, you know, you would have one gallery in, uh, in New York, you would have another gallery in Los Angeles, another gallery in London, another gallery in Berlin, another gallery in Greece. And, and you had all of these different communities and different artist groups that you would interact with. And so it was always this kind of flow of new information coming in. And today, of course, as everything's gone more global, everything's become more singular. So our galleries are very, very large. They're uh, located all around the world. And so you just don't have as much uh, variation of communities and interacting with people that you used to. I mean, does that complicate it for you, or does that help it for you? Uh, well, it, it, it's different. I mean, uh, I'm very, you know, involved with my work. I'm in the studio. If I would be younger, I think I would be, uh, you know, really uh, missing a lot of all the different interactions with uh, all the different people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh, Let's just go back to the beginning for a second. You started your career really working at MoMA um, as a, you know, I think uh, really as a... As, as, I'm not sure exactly what role, but you were in security, or, or, or in, 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 what, what was your original job at MoMA? Uh, Museum of Modern Art was my first job in New York, so I, uh, I would go there every day. I'd ask them for a job, and uh, I was a preparator in Chicago. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I was a preparator at the Museum of Contemporary Art. So when I came to New York, I wanted to be a preparator at the Modern. And I would go and call them every day, no, no, no. And finally they called me, they said, Jeff, we have an opening in the ticket booth, selling the tickets. And I said, I'll take it. And so, uh, but at the, in the ticket booth, when I'd get a break, they'd put me behind the information membership desk. And that's where they would sell uh, memberships, renew people's memberships. And I actually realized mm -hmm. that nobody was trying to sell memberships. And uh, over a period of, uh, I guess, about two years, I doubled the Museum of Modern Arts membership. <laughs> and for people coming in off the street, uh, the memberships uh, sold to uh, the public coming in. And so Blanchette Rockefeller, I mean, this sounds absurd, but this is true. She created the title for me, the Senior Representative of the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember those early days? Were there particular works that you just would love to go see, whether from your art history background or, or, or more contemporary? Well, you know, I loved the architectural design department, but the projects gallery always had really interesting uh, works coming in. Bill Beckley, I loved the photo narrative. Uh, uh, work Bill Beckley was doing, Jackie Windsor, of course always seeing the Duchamps and uh, looking at the Guernica and studying the collection. I would go see movies after work also. But every day just going through uh, the museum was a great experience. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great beginning and obviously your, your career has come a very long way in a different part of the art world. Um, but it's, uh, it's, 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 I'm sure you still love to go to MoMA but in a different capacity. Um, you know, in, in terms of um, your work at auction, because there's a lot of, it, your work has frequently gone to auction, do you remember the very first time a work of yours went to auction and what that felt like? Did you follow it? Were you nervous? You know, what, what was the original sense that that gave you? Because you, you strike me as somebody that's used to a lot of control, and you, you don't really have a lot of control at auction. Yeah, there's no, there's no control. But, um, and, you know, Ileana Sonneben also never believed in participating in the uh, auctions. So, you know, sometimes you can hear that different uh, people try to be involved in auctions and try to give support and, 
you know, buy works or things like this. To, uh, you know, Ileana was just, you know, you, you just don't touch it. It just happens. And, uh, and so that was the philosophy that uh, I was always uh, a part of. Uh, but I, I don't know. I remember uh, the first work coming to auction, what it would have been. It was probably something from maybe the statuary series. I think the, it was in very early Bob Hope was one of the ones that came up very early. No, that was statuary series. Uh, and I, I remember when I was younger, I would be more aware that the auctions were happening, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I mean, do you get do you get nervous now, or do you follow it now? And you know, do you? I mean, when when the works have made really giant prices, I mean, emotionally, do you remember like any anything at I mean, those I, moments? I, I follow it because I I don't want to be uh, you know kind of naive, but mm -hmm. you know I'm not involved in all the details. I try to be sure that if a work is there that it's presented in the best manner that it can be so uh, if it's a complicated piece if we can help install it in uh, some manner but yeah you, there's a, a certain place where you exercise all the control in making the work and kind of presenting it but then you know it, it, it's out of your hands and you just have to let go uh, I also have to state that a lot of times when people talk about the market and they'll bring up about a balloon dog or something like that. You know, I really have to pinch myself because, you know, that's not me. I mean, uh, uh, I'm involved with, you know, making my works and all of this. Uh, I'm not involved in that dialogue as far as, you know, the cost. All that is an, another abstraction. And so I really have to, oh, okay, okay that's right. That is associated with me, okay. Uh, you know, but do you just, get? But are you sensitive to it? Does it hurt your feelings when you see commentary about you know greed and money and fame and you know the, especially in social media today and just the press in general is just so free with negativity. You know, do you does do you, does it affect you at all? It it affects me not for myself, but it affects me for the realization that so much of our society is really cynical, mm -hmm. and so much of our society really is looking at negative and trying to get self-empowerment through being negative and in, uh, in bringing down instead of, you know, kind of functioning in the opposite uh, kind of way, you know. That's a fair, fair point. You know, at, at this point, what would you say fuels you? I mean, you've obviously had a tremendous amount of success, and I mean from an artistic perspective, because I know you're very um, focused on your family, but, you know, what is it that kind of drives you forward still today that wants you to keep pushing, to keep doing more and more, and keep making more great art? Uh, my interests, you know. And uh, I remember starting to think about uh, why. Somebody asked me, you know, one time after having a very successful exhibition, it was a banality, uh, they asked me, you know, Jeff, aren't you afraid that it's gonna leave you sometime? And I just thought, oh, it's really so strange to be young and have such a big successful exhibition and somebody asking, aren't you afraid it's gonna leave you? So I started to think about, well, you know, what is it that you do? What, is, what does an artist do uh, to make a work? And I would think back to, okay, you know, I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, and uh, you know, maybe you take a little break from your work for three months, you, you go visit your relatives or something, then you come back and you start your work again and it's kind of like starting a car, you know, you try to turn it over and start making some art. Well, you know, that doesn't feel just right, you know? And it's like, you know, clunk, clunk. And okay, so you start a new piece and, you know, it's like, you know, starting that car again, like clunk, 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 clunk. And, you know, you're doing a little better. Now your work feels a little better. And then you start another work and then all of a sudden it's like the car turning over, you know, you turn it. And, uh, you know, it's the way the art is. Then all of a sudden, oh yeah, it's in gear. Do you feel that? Now I'm making exactly what I want to make. And so the only thing that you can do is follow your interests. And you have to trust in yourself because, you know, if you trust in yourself, then you can take this kind of inward journey. You follow your interests. And if you focus on those interests, and that's the only thing that anybody can do in any profession, whether you're a doctor or Glenn, if you're involved in economics or whatever, is to trust in yourself, follow your interests, focus on those interests, and that become, that takes you to a metaphysical state. And when you get to that point, there's like a light bulb that goes off, and I'm just thinking to your most recent show, Gagosian, and hearing you talking about you know, your passion for art history, I mean, it just seems like those gazing ball paintings brought it all together for you. I mean, it was art historical imagery, 
beautiful paintings with the sculptural element of the, of the gazing ball. I mean, did you kind of feel that aha moment that this was like it all came together for you there? Uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, but when you get to that metaphysical moment, just from you know trusting in yourself, following your interests, focusing on those interests, uh, time and space bend, and you connect to the universal. And we've all experienced it. I know that everybody here, when you've trusted in yourself and you've followed your interests, you've felt it. And time and space bends. You can walk down the street. People look familiar to you. Whatever it is, you're connected with the universal. And so I felt that with the Gazing Ball show. And I always feel if you keep everything in play, it can happen every day. And, you know, just be a continuation. Just, but, uh, you know, generally what happens, people, it becomes more tiring to keep everything in play. But uh, through practicing acceptance of really being open to everything and accepting everything for being perfect in its own being, it uh, keeps things from being, uh, you know, segregated and being in some way not looked at as being significant you know, at that uh, moment to you. But if you keep everything in play, it's all resource to be used. And I mean, that's, that's I, I'd, I'd like to try to get that, get, get, get that down myself because it sounded really good. Um, but, I, uh, but I totally see that you're genuine and, and, and you're getting to that point is a beautiful thing, so. But if, you know, if other artists are here, when you've uh, taken a break and you've started up again, I mean, isn't it that process? I mean, I think it, everybody's experienced that process. Gets going, oh, okay, you need to do a little more. You have to focus a little more. You focus a little more. Now you focus again a little more, and now again, and then you're there. Okay, now we're going. I mean, that was gonna close with something like that. I mean, is there, is there a particular bit of advice that you've gotten yourself over the years that you would mention to the artists in the audience as something to just really keep in mind beyond what you've just described? Uh, I don't I, I think the, the best advice is to be generous, you know, uh, uh, to be generous. I mean, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to do something and uh, you try to pick up on what other people have done and to absorb, be open to, uh, to things in life. I try to be open and to, uh, uh, to let things uh, come in and then just to be as generous as possible. Uh, the more you give, the more you get. Yeah. Well, Jeff, we're gonna take a couple questions from the audience because I know you only have a few minutes, um, but um, why don't we take a few questions from the audience, yes? Um, thank you for your presence and time tonight. Um, I'm curious to know um, if you could elaborate a little bit about your relationship with suffering question has to do with the relationship Jeff has with suffering in his work? Uh, generally, it's easier to look at other artists in different areas of different professions and you can think, oh, well, you know, they must have suffered a little bit in life because they have needs that they are, you know, really kind of push them that they really want to communicate with people or in some manner uh, um, have some affirmation within their uh, uh, community. Uh, suffering. Uh, I grew up, you know, I grew up in, I would say, uh, a lower middle class family. I don't know, my family was probably in a home that cost them about $6,000 when they built it in 55. But we always experienced a sense of social mobility. My parents, uh, we always went to wonderful vacations and each year we'd get a nicer vacation, a larger room or go to a more spectacular site and so my parents always uh, made my sister and I feel like that we were on a journey and that we could continue to move and accomplish and uh, uh, to achieve the things we want. Uh, suffering. I had a child when I was uh, I guess uh, 19 years of age and uh, I wasn't able to raise my daughter. I always wanted her to be able to find me. She did find me when she was 21 and has uh, shared her life uh, with me since that uh, point. But that was a suffering moment. You know? uh, Thank you. Next question. Yes, way in the back, on the side there. Um, hi, Mr. Kirby. I have a question about how you feel the art viewer shifts has shifted Question just about the changing dynamics of uh, the 
art gallery business uh, and the dealer relationship maybe since Ileana to today? Well, you know, it's scale. And um, it's, I'm sure it's the same for the artists. Artists in a certain way have a, a larger scale than uh, maybe uh, before. But the, the community was uh, much more about uh, uh, individuals and everybody had their part. Now, they're still that way today. It, you know, it's not just a large gallery. There are many, many people that work within the galleries and they have different associations. But things were uh, smaller. It was more uh, fragmented. But there's, a, you know, a continuation where things are condensing and that there's uh, fewer identities, but they're larger identities, they're more powerful identities. It seems like that's something that's uh, uh, continuing. But I always believe that if people want to participate, they can. And I, I think a young artist today, if they really want to be involved and they want to have a dialogue in contemporary art, they can. Yes, sir. So, as I know that you were born the same year like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, uh, do you believe in astrology or what, what does it actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> the astrological coincidence of Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and Jeff Koons, I like that. The, tri the triumvirate. No, but you know, I'm, I'm sure, I know that uh, you know when you're born and the different things that are taking place within the economies and the political backgrounds, the sense of opportunities. You know, all this has a huge effect uh, on your life, and so uh, and the only thing you can do is to try to make the most of it. And I want to try to use that platform that I have. I mean, I always wanted to be part of this dialogue, and. Uh, be part of the dialogue with Andy and Roy and uh, you know Duchamp, Picabia, this this whole idea, and uh, I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity. I, I mean, think in somewhat in something of the same vein, do you feel that religion is a strong part uh, presence in your work? I think the idea of uh, transcendence, the idea of reaching uh, kind of one's own potential, uh, that you can continue to become. And then this is all based in philosophy. I always enjoyed Kierkegaard and Sartre, uh, Nietzsche. Um, so uh, maybe one last question. Yes. Uh, you've been involved in a number of copyright lawsuits, and I'm wondering whether you now license properties like the lobster label downstairs, mm -hmm. and how fear of litigation has maybe influenced your work at all. Questions about litigation and fear of litigation, and you know. The, the, you know, more than just you, but I think artists today need to have a lawyer on your team more than you used to ever before. Yeah, uh, you know, I ended up being involved in some uh, copyright infringement cases, and I, I was really surprised because, you know, I was just following a way of looking at the world, uh, the way from perceptions of the way Picasso looked at the world, or Max Ernst, or Man Ray, or you know, uh, Warhol, Lichtenstein and that everything was kind of available. It's like a vocabulary. It's uh, like somebody not owning the letter A and somebody else owning B. But all of a sudden I got involved in uh, uh, some litigations. But if I felt that I should uh, seek permission, I always did. So when I made my luxury degradation series, uh, I contacted Jim Beam, or when I made the ads for the paintings, I, I contacted everybody. But I ran into problems actually when I didn't think that there was any need to contact anybody. So I became aware of it. I try to always avoid the problem, and uh, I always seek, uh, you know, permission where I think that there can ever, you know, even be any problem that comes up in the future, because I found out that almost 99.9% .9 of the time, everybody always says yes. And people are supportive of each other's endeavors, and they want people to, you know, be able to accomplish things and do things and enjoy life, basically. And uh, you know, same w with my work. I mean, I do have some intellectual uh, rights to some things, but, you know, if people contact me, oh, I'd like to incorporate something uh, in, into my work. I mean, I think I've always have said yes. You know. Well, listen, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I will just say one thing before we close. We are having another one of these conversations on May 10th with four superstar women artists. If you're in town, you want to come. Uh, Betty Tompkins, uh, Nancy Grossman, uh, Lori Simmons, and Marilyn Winter. So that'll be a fantastic night. But for tonight, Jeff, thank you so much. It's really an honor. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Really great. Appreciate it.